I have a question for, for I have a question for Dr. Parinandi. And the, the question is, uh, in, in all that, uh, all those chains of events that you were describing this morning, when uh, mercury atoms would, uh, would set off the, the reactions with the uh, phospholipases, uh, you seem to be indicating that the, the calcium channel was the site of the. Did, did you indicate that the calcium channel was the site of the primary injury? And then it was intracellular calcium that would set the whole chain off, or was there some direct effect of mercury on the uh, on the phospholipases? Oh, it, it's actually. <laughs> it looks like it's probably both. Okay, some mercury goes in, and uh, it actually attacks phospholipases. So it's actually a three pong pathway. One is mercury increases calcium level through calcium channels. And the, because the phospholipases are calcium-dependent enzymes, especially CPLA2 and PLD also a calcium-dependent enzyme, you need calcium. So it increases calcium on one side, okay? On the other side, it also causes glutathione depletion. And when glutathione is depleted, it's a, a redox activation of the enzyme. That's known. That's the second one. And the third one, most probably, your question is very well taken. Mercury probably directly binds to phospholipase D and phospholipase A2 because they are both histidine, histidine active sites. Histidine, mercury not only reacts with glutathione, mercury also complexes with the histidine. It is known. So that's how it activates. The whole, uh, so three ways mercury, how mercury activates. One is by binding glutathione and making glutathione inaccessible or inaccessible. Number two, by activating the voltage-gated calcium channels, increasing calcium levels intracellular, that calcium activates PLD and PLA2. Number three, by also attacking PLD or PLA2 directly at the histidine active site, and some more because of that. So you may ask me, how do you know if I treat with zinc, I completely abolish that. Okay, zinc binds to histidine. Number third, fourth one, ROS. The ROS production is a little late because mercury, I think mercury is activating NADPH oxidase. So it's bad for everything. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, well, that's what we are, that, that's, Steve, I can tell, I teach uh, general pathology to the second year dental students, and uh, in our seventh edition of the Robbins textbook, there's, there's a whole page and a half on all the bad things that happen when you get too much calcium coming into the cytoplasm, or cytosol. Well, while you're answering, do you have any comment on, uh, on the ischemic bone disease as far as the use of oxygen ozone in place of surgery, or in addition to, or complementary to? I don't have enough experience or expertise to answer uh, that question. I know some people who do it, and a uh, few say it doesn't help at all. Others say, boy, it's wonderful stuff. And so I, I, as far as I know, there's no paper that has been published relating to that in bone, ischemic bone disease. I wish I could answer that. I'd love to, but I can't. Then I'll ask Dr. Murray, as far as uh, do you use any uh, dental material reactivity testing uh, prior to, because you know, many of us see these compromised patients who can only tolerate certain materials. Yeah, I, um, I have a uh, physician that I work with who comes in and does all the biocompatibility, all the muscle testing uh, to find out the uh, compatibility before we put in the seric restoration. And then we also follow all the protocols on the amalgam removal uh, that are set forward. So uh, she oversees all that. Uh, most of my patients are actually brought by her uh, right to my office. Uh, so uh, when we're done, even before we start, she uh, you know takes the burial link and does the muscle testing and uh, and that sort of thing uh, before we even begin, so we can find out uh, what bonding agent is most compatible and uh, and do all those th tests as well. And have you, has she compared uh, muscle testing to uh, Clifford testing as far as since Clifford oh, wow. testing has like 500 references, monograph, 
from a research standpoint as far as accuracy compared to you know, muscle testing uh, depends a lot of times on the, the ability of the tester. Right. Um, well, I know that she does most of that testing for me and lets me know what block. Uh, I can tell you from my experience, the Vita block on most of these patients are, are completely biocompatible. It's rectified most of their situations and uh, it's probably the only material that I've seen that uh, really, uh, really is compatible and, and makes them feel much better and uh, she tells me it, it's done a great job. One last question to you is, uh, a few years ago there was a, uh, a, a research paper on uh, um, porcelain uh, cracking or fracturing when it didn't have a metal substrate. Any comment on that? Yeah, we're not dealing with porcelain. Uh, that was stacked. And what happens is when you stack porcelain, you get air bubbles in there, which propagates the cracks. We're dealing with a pressed ceramic. And when this ceramic is pressed, it eliminates all the porosities, which is why the cracks don't propagate, which is really why the material is, is a lot more durable without the metal uh, and, and longer lasting. Grab a microphone. Come right on. Dr. Paranandi, in, could you um, explain how you identified or what you used to identify the mercury specificity in these studies? You had mentioned that, there were, that you could tell different species of mercury that were influencing, that were being affected by the phospholipases. Or oh, different species of mercury? Yeah. Yeah. Well, basically, to start with, we used, we used uh, inorganic mercury, like mercury, chlo mercury chloride. And we used methyl mercury as a metabolite of mercury. That's an organic mercury. And we also used thimerosal, which is also an organic form, but a pharmaceutical form. So we, those three different forms of mercury, because I didn't want to use just inorganic mercury, because I will tell you the problems. I will be very honest here. Inorganic mercury, after a certain concentration, will precipitate in media. It's very difficult to get it dissolved. I used mercury chloride. People prefer to use mercury sulfate. OK, you need to try both. But the problem with mercury sulfate is adjusting pH. I have to be very careful with when I do these studies. Is it pH effect or is it not pH effect? Okay, that's why I used mercury chloride. And methyl mercury is also very dangerous to use. I never allow my kids to make these solutions in the lab. I do it myself. I tell them I'm 50 years old. You guys are young. I can do it honestly. And third one is thimerosal is also nasty. And 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 so I use those. One more question I can sense from your question is the speciation inside. That is inside, once it goes inside the cell, the speciation is very important. That's what we have to recognize. Where it binds, what molecular weight protein it binds, is it small molecular weight or large molecular weight protein, what is its metal ligand exchange, where it actually flips from one to the other, because once it bound to the protein, if that protein is degraded, these questions were never addressed. If that protein is degraded, will the mercury be taken by another protein? Okay, what is some, for example, in, in, in marine organisms, it has been known in, in marine uh, nematodes, mercury accumulates in the body and the mercury is trapped inside a vesicle in the cell and it stays there till the life of the, of the organism. Okay, these are actually, there is a heavy load of metallothionin in it. And the metallothionin, the, by name, metallothionin, thionine means it has got 80% cysteines in it. It's a 10,000 molecular weight protein. You and I make it. And this actually mobilizes zinc in the body. And when there is a heavy metal toxicity, that protein is induced. And that is also attached with the glucocorticoid receptor. Steve was actually telling me about some of the work, steroid hormones and other things, actually antibiotic resistance. And the same thing, steroid hormone receptor and metallothionin are linked in the gene. So this metallothionin traps the mercury or zinc or lead and sequesters it. The property of the metallothionin is to de for the detoxification. So again, we don't know how much is bound to the albumin so these are the speciations. Again, the mercury does not change oxidation reduction states that much in the body, but where it binds, 
that binding, the coordination is so strong. That's what it is when people are talking about detoxification of mercury. Unfortunately, I don't know how much you can detoxify. Let's not think it is free. I can't get it out. So my problem is it already has started conformational changes. So body mercury levels, why lead accumulates in brain? It accumulates in brain because it's, that's it. You can't get rid of what is accumulating in the brain. No matter whatever you do, you can't detoxify it. What about, there was mentioned a few years ago at one of the meetings, um, of talking to one of the investigators, that there's evidence of cytochrome P450s in the brain. So if there is, I mean, and I, I believe from the research that I've done that there are cytochromes not only in your liver and every tissue, there could be cytochromes in the, fifth, in the brain. Without okay, let me, let me tell you, cytochrome P450 cannot do anything to mercury or any other transition metal. Okay, cytochrome P450 cannot detoxify transition metals. Cytochrome P450 only can detoxify drugs or xenobiotics or organic molecules. There is detoxification system in the body is two, stage, two, two types coupled with each other. That is called phase one, second one is phase two. If you take a drug or if you, if you are exposed to say some other organic molecule that is metabolized by cytochrome P450 system, mostly in the liver, second in the lung, third in the kidney, fourth a little bit in the heart, fifth in the placenta. The reason placenta has high cytochrome P450, there is a reason to protect the, the fetus. And sixth, there is a little bit in the brain. So most of the cytochrome P450 is present in the liver. That is a xenobiotic detoxifying system. It only acts on organic molecules. On inorganic molecules, it can detoxify. So in the phase one, it hydroxylates the molecule. It makes it water soluble. In phase two, it conjugates with glutathione. And it makes glutathione conjugates. And then it is excreted in the bile. So detoxification by cytochrome P450 is only possible, is only exclu exclusively possible for organic molecules, like drugs and xenobiotics. For metals, detoxification is only done by metal binding proteins, such as metallothionin. The metallothionin is rich in sulfidyl groups. That is the reason why it is present there. It mobilizes them, indeed, it sequesters them, puts them in a safer place so that you cannot access it, okay? And similarly in plants, there is another metal binding protein which detoxifies, it call, it's called phytochelatin. So phytochelatin is also inducible. Plants take up a lot of cadmiums, lead, and other transition metals from the soil. So that is a detoxification mechanism. That's different because you can't change the metal that much. So it's only organic molecules are detoxified by cytochrome P450. So when it goes to the brain, that is the reason why people, kids are affected by lead. You can't get rid of it from the brain. Sorry, I gave a long, long. Uh, <laughs> no, um, I worked at drug metabolism for a while, and that's what it, it, I, I was thinking more in terms of the absorption of the mercury onto the protein, uh, even the metallothionines, and then whether or not the cytochrome, when that protein began to degrade, whether or not it would be able to then. Okay, thank you. Yeah. For <coughs> Dr. Bucco, uh, concerning ischemic bone disease, is the amount of epinephrine in a typical carpule of uh, 1 to 100,000 lidocaine or septocaine enough to contraindicate it in a PDL injection? And number two, is uh, uh, we use much more of the Novocaine in a typical infiltration injection. And so would 1 to 100,000 be uh, contraindicated for that concerning ischemic bone disease? I would love to uh, tell you there's some study out there that shows that, but uh, this um, idea is just a suggestion of mine that would make maybe our, our bones more susceptible to other bones. But we've been using these anesthetics for a long, long time with uh, epinephrine or variants thereof, and uh, we seem to get away with it most of the time. One thing I didn't, and I think it's because the timing of lack of blood flow or diminished blood flow is short enough. But uh, another thing that happens that um, is a big thing now in the basic pathology textbooks, again, is once you reperfuse, there are a lot of um, uh, oxy radicals that are produced when that blood comes rushing back into a, a bone. So our, the bones are getting a double hit. But the, as far as I know, there's no research that 
talks about that, what you're talking about. And I've got uh, one quick question for Dr. Morin. Uh, you talked about Emacs, which I believe is lithium disilicate. Right. And you talked about silicosis. So uh, two points. Number one, what you were talking about with the amount of occlusal wear from a, an Emacs, whether it's CAD CAM or whether it's uh, uh, done by a regular impression or whatever, is that uh, just a theoretical consideration or is there research to show that there would actually be a danger of silicosis? Oh. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the study out of Geneva states the fact is that when it was ground on, so what happens is the Emacs block, when it comes out of the machine, is in an unfinished form. Most people put that in the mouth and then occlusally adjust or grind the contacts. That is when it's dangerous. It goes in the furnace, and when it goes in the furnace, then it's glass infiltrated. It's sort of locked in, and then it becomes a ceramic porcelain that is no longer uh, those silicate molecules are, are exposed to the grinding process of a burr or chewing, so they're locked in. So it really becomes really dangerous when you're grinding it in its preformed set before you have to fire it in the oven. When you put it in the mouth, a clues of wear would not be an issue. for Not be an issue. Okay, the second thing is, are you aware of any research um, showing any unusual toxicity for lithium disilicate, uh, as opposed to as opposed to Vita porcelain or or you know any of the other materials we use. On the a problem day. is Emacs is so new; uh, it, it, it's brand new material. It's only been out a year. There aren't really. I, I'm not aware of any current studies that suggest anything like that whatsoever. Have you done uh, CAD CAM with with uh, Emacs? Yes, I have. Yes, but I, I do it very carefully. I don't do any grinding in its in its uh, pre uh, post milling stage. Uh, at all, because uh, unless you, uh, you, you want to uh, activate that silicate molecule or, or uh, uh, release it, uh, I'd, be, I'd be careful of that. Thanks. And I have a question for Jerry Boko. Is that when we did, the, in 1987, uh, when uh, Dr. Vimy implanted mercury fillings in sheep and then 88 in monkeys, um, immediately within 30 days, there was a, uh, a considerable amount of mercury deposited in the jawbone. And we just heard from Dr. Leinbach uh, that, uh, you know, the gingiva absorbs fluoride. And so you get fluoride also saturating bones. Um, can that have uh, implications in uh, the uh, diseases that you're seeing? Do you think there's an increase? I remember the first time I read that, that first, the sheep paper, and I was amazed. <laughs> yeah. uh, it fascinated me because of that uh, position of material in the bone around the teeth. And um, uh, Dr. Bimmy and I have been together on the same podium at different meetings, and uh, uh, he, he explained pretty carefully how he did those restorations, and there's no chance of that being just spill that had to somehow have been incorporated into the bone. So I think that's probably an issue. Uh, Boyd Haley says that there's a fair amount of mercury and um, tin, I think, in a lot of the NECO samples. And I should mention, uh, I've, uh, my research has been kind of in abeyance because I became a chairman. And um, it's just, I'm getting back to all of that, but one of the things we're doing is looking for biofilms in these NECO samples through, with the uh, uh, biofilm experts at the University of Texas Medical School. And we have found some, uh, but they're perio bugs, and so we're wondering, we just have to figure out if it's contaminant or not. And also we are finally, Boyd and I are trying to get an IRB together so that we can compare my tissue samples with his results um, from his lab. And uh, in another year, maybe two years, we'll have some answers. But right now I don't have the answer. Can you explain why CEREC is the least sensitive in the posterior? Um, well, I, I think the studies revolve around the expansion contraction of the material. Uh, most sensitivity comes from two things. Number one is bacterial invasion uh, when the tooth is either left empty for a period of time or left exposed. And number two comes from the expansion contraction of the material. The fact is that CEREC is the closest material on the planet that has the identical same thermal coefficient of expansion as human enamel. Uh, that's what leads to most of its non-sensitivity. So what happened with the CEREC-1 and the CEREC-2, all those failures that were documented? Uh, well, I mean, CEREC-1, CEREC-2, I mean, uh, any lab has the same kind of failures. I, I, I relate it back to operator error. I think we see a lot of failures, but uh, you don't blame the laboratory for crowns that fall off, uh, but there is computers, garbage in, garbage out. Without the proper training, without the proper specification, paying attention to the proper prep specification, I think you're going to have failure. Uh, but if you look longitudinally from CEREC-1, to CEREC-3, as Gordon pointed out, over 94% effective over 20 years. 
there isn't a better restoration on the planet. Thank you. You're welcome. Has the Vita porcelain changed since Serac 2? Um, has Vita porcelain changed since Serac 2? The, the block um, material. And in the composition of it? The block material. The block material. Um, minutely, I think it's, uh, they've uh, removed a little bit of the aluminum that was in there. It has less aluminum. Uh, and I think that it's also um, uh, incorporated some other filler materials to make it more translucent. So that's how they got the Trilux block. But the basic formulation of, of the block of the ceramic is, is, is practically the same. The reason for the question is because I used to have a Ceric II also. Uh -huh. And I used Dicor rather than the Vita porcelain because this, the uh, Dicor had better coefficients of flex yep. than, the, than the Vita did. And yep. they were saying that if, if, if you had something that was too rigid that would not give it the same amount as the natural two structure, then that's going to cause either cementation failures or fracture as well. So I'm just wondering if that had changed. Um, well, I, I don't think that's changed. Dicor was an incredible material. We'd love to have uh, dense supply back in the game, but uh, currently they're not in the game, so uh, Dicor is not available. But what they found with the Vita material in terms of the way that happens is that um, when it's stacked by the lab, again, it's, it's got the porosities in it, which has really caused it to be really brittle. When it's pressed, most of that brittleness goes out of it. Uh, and once it's encased inside of enamel, uh, it almost acts like the exact same system before. We got hard enamel on the outside, and we got soft dentin on the inside. We got a hard ceramic shell that's lined with varial link, which is a soft material. And so we're almost creating the same system that, that God put together originally. Okay. Uh, Dr. Boko, I spoke yesterday on uh, osteonecrosis, both the conventional and the bisphosphonate also. And in my studies uh, that I've done, the, the literature, on the bisphosphonate uh, induced, it said that the zomita and iridia uh, would potentially cause uh, bisphosphonate osteonecrosis in as little as, I think, uh, eight months to 14 months. And then they were also saying that on the orals, uh, Fosomax and uh, uh, the Boniva and some of the others, that it took up to three years. But in my own practice, I've seen a couple of, couple of patients on the orals that were starting to be symptomatic with either bone pain or, or lesions uh, in under six months. So I was wondering if you have any uh, information as far as how safe we would be to do invasive procedures on somebody that had just recently started the bisphosphonate. Uh, and also if you have a, an opinion on how long, they're saying the orals uh, have a half-life of 10 years and the uh, IVs may be for life. I was wondering if you had any feedback on that. Yeah, it's certainly true, the IV drugs. Well, there is an IV annual drug. It's essentially a, a smaller version of the Zomeda that is being used as a, an osteoporotic medication now. But uh, when we're talking about the cancer-related drugs, the, the risk is anywhere from 2 to 7%. And, most, and you can get um, problems even in the, within the first year or so. But even with those, uh, the standard seems to be you don't worry so much for the first 18 months. There are always going to be outliers, though, and that could be your patient in your practice. And there's no way to predict that um, in an individual basis. Relative to the Fosamax equivalents, um, it's pretty hard to be able to put a real handle on that. Uh, there, there is some indication that maybe that stuff has gone out of the body within about six months. And that's kind of new information, whereas the cancer-related medica medications, you just, you literally have to recycle your skeleton. It will never unattach. So you, when you remodel, at my age, it would take me about 12 years to get a new skeleton. And if Dave can get me walking again, maybe I can, uh, maybe it'll be down to 10 years. But even in a young person, it's seven years to replace your whole skeleton. So that's really how you get rid of that, those drugs. Um, we, I, I mentioned that uh, we're starting to look more closely at the, the osteoporotic medications. And one of the things that I think might be helpful is just thinking about it. If you've got a patient who's got residual sockets, is tenderness, uh, tender or painful, I would worry about that. It's just empiric. But uh, we are using, we've got an NIH uh, um, grant now, um, we're going to use the Cavitat to look at bisphosphonate patients and see if we can find 
those that are going to break down before they're going to break down. And then the next step is to use uh, near-infrared light, uh, some LED. We've got a company in Canada that has a LED light that hangs over the maxilla and another one that hangs over the mandible. And patients just watch TV for half an hour a day while they're getting uh, light uh, sent through the bone. And um, so far, the results are pretty encouraging that that brings the bone back to a better condition. But um, I'm with you. I wish I, we knew more about that. Uh, doctor, um, there are athletes uh, that are falling dead on the football field and uh, basketball courts from the idiopathic cardiomyopathy. And in my research and from what we've heard at some of the other meetings, these athletes have got accumulations of mercury in the, in the heart muscle that are like 22 or 25,000 times the normal numbers that I remember. I'm wondering why there hasn't been any research done on that. Is it because nobody wants to go take on the mercury issue to find out, you know, if, if that in fact is causal or, or is it because uh, grant money is not available or, or what? Well, grant money is not available, that's no, <laughs> probably that's number one. One issue, second one is I, I would like to see this study. But like, did they publish or is the report made or is just a... Uh, I believe it. I believe it was published. If I remember correctly, have information that. Yeah. yeah. But but very high concentration. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So do you know? Uh, just a question I'm asking you. Do you know how? What is the source of mercury in these athletes? They haven't identified. They didn't do that at all. Hmm. I was just. I, I was curious why. If, in fact, autopsy studies are showing such a high concentration, why there hasn't been some research uh, done to confirm causality of the, of the, the death and then also, um, you know, because that would be things that we could use uh, so for, you, for our you, benefit as an, as an academy as well. So you think these, these athletes had uh, dental amalgams? I would guess. The, the study he's referring to is the Fistachi study, I think. Maybe John can pronounce it right. It's an Italian study. It wasn't done in the United States. And they took several, uh, I can't remember the exact number, uh, uh, hearts that, uh, where the victim had died of IDCM. And uh, I believe they examined it with Newton activation analysis. But there was 22,000 22, times more mercury in the, heart, in the heart of somebody that died of IDCM than somebody that died of a heart attack, and, uh, which is not necessarily a healthy heart. So that was, I mean, that's, Boyd Haley says if you injected a heart with 22,000 times more mercury than is found in a, say, a cardiovascular problem, uh, it's, it's causal. You know, you, it's just a huge amount. Oh, yeah, it is, it is. It is phenomenally, it is, it is very high. And I, I don't think I, I'm really surprised they lived that long. And to play even on the field, at one, yeah, because a heart muscle would not even tolerate that. John, John Wilson told me of a colleague uh, that uh, recently had his amalgams removed uh, and uh, that uh, the dentist did not follow the IMT protocols and that within two weeks he developed uh, IDCM and uh, had he not received a heart transplant, he would not be alive. I think one, one recommendation, I think, I'm not a clinician, but I think you, you, you're all you know, gurus in that. I think one thing, if you find a patient with dental amalgams for a long time, ask them to get an eco done. Eco, echocardiography, echocardiography done, and also ask them to go for, I think you will do a favor, I ask them to go for the endothelial test. They will also go and look at their blood vessels and how the endothelial function of the blood vessel is right. There are a lot of non-invasive techniques now Eco can, they can do that. Eco will tell more than, as you know, more than the regular EKG. And I think they should do that. Unfortunately, we cannot go into the heart muscle and look at mercury levels. And I have a very strong object, not a bias, uh, that blood levels will not tell anything. Please, I think even not only for mercury, for any, most of the substances, blood levels don't tell anything. The best thing, because I'm in the Heart Institute and I see my colleagues, my both clinical colleagues, and also both my basic science colleagues who work very closely on, on these imaging techniques. And it's, uh, Ohio State has got a very good imaging facility. Well, I think uh, what I recommend is if all the 
dental dentists and dental clinicians, if you find your patients having amalgam, not only worrying about their detoxification, send them for both blood vessel testing as well as function testing, resistance, and as well as the myocardial function by ECO. I think this is a very alarming one, and I think we should, I think this is an indication that the, these people are actually accumulating mercury in their cardiac muscle, and uh, I think we should get it done. And also nephrotoxicity, we should not forget kidney too. And kidney is also a source for this. It is like, as you mentioned, Steve, it's bad for a, it, it goes and probably it also gets a, it's a tubule function is also, where there is a cardiac insult, the kidney also gets hit because hypertension affects on the kidney too. So this is just what I think. Maybe studies should be done. Um, this question is also for Dr. Paranandi. Uh, you discovered that phospholipase D ends up getting activated by mercury down the cascade. And when you cleave the, pho cleave the phosphatidylcholine, eventually you have all the arachidonic acid laying around, but do you think there's any effect from having a lot of choline laying around, especially perhaps in neural areas, to, to drive different equilibrium in different directions, some of the dementia you can see with? Well, that is actually, it has been speculated for a long time that choline coming from PLD could also do these neuro, uh, neurotransmission alterations by acetylcholinesterase and other things. That has been, there are a couple of papers on that subject, but not very tightly done. Choline could also contribute, yes. But the biggest problem is when you cleave the enzyme, cleave the phospholipid, you make a phosphatidic acid, which is an acidic phospholipid there. And also, not only that, immediately also make a lysophospholipid. That means one fatty acid is gone, so you make a hole in the membrane. So what I'm concerned, I'm not concerned more about choline here. I'm concerned about the membrane architecture. So once the architecture, once the walls are gone, we don't have a house. If there are a couple of holes made in the, wall, in the walls of our house, and everything comes inside. So that's what it is. Uh, I can say I've lived a long time in West Virginia, and you can have a house with holes in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Warren's advice, because uh, you know our, our mission, and we're, we're a special interest group, and uh, we all do different types of practice, and, and scratch the surface, and there's uh, different politics and religions, and everything. But we're unified on the on, on the idea that our profession has been endangering people's health for 200 years. Uh, mercury's bad for for everything. Um, and our, the, the reason I'm, I'm asking you for advice is because you are the person who teaches and touches hundreds and hundreds of general dentists who are, uh, uh, they're, the, they're the type of general dentists who are uh, thoughtful and looking for new things and are willing to learn. And uh, as the, uh, the, the IOMT is kind of looking to recontact the mainstream of dentistry. We've been kind of isolated and, and antagonistic for a long time. Uh, how would you recommend that we broach the subject of just how dangerous it is? The real subject is how dangerous it is to remove a mouth in a given patient, be dangerous for the patient, for the staff, for the dentist herself, himself. Um, well, How that, would you bring that <clears throat> that's a great question. I've been going across the country for years trying to get dentists to look at the steric technology. And, you know, the hardest thing to do is get a dentist to change. So the way I would do it is reverse. Uh, I think if you go to the patient, uh, if you go to the public, uh, I think that will force dentists to change quick. Because uh, uh, what they didn't do with CAD CAM is if CAD CAM was on Oprah Winfrey about the one visit crown and it was on TV, let me tell you something, every dentist in here would have a CAD CAM overnight because your patients would be knocking on your door going, can I get that thing you can do one day? Uh, and I think that's where Denta, uh, Patterson has really missed and Serona has missed. Uh, so as the IMOT, uh, what I would do is I think you need to take your message to the public. Uh, I think you need to get it out in magazines. Uh, I think you need to get it out everywhere you possibly can because if dentists read this and see this, they've seen what you've done with the FDA, I, I think you're going to get a great grant, ground swell behind you. And I think this organization will grow three, four times the size it is right now. 
uh, I'm going to continue to do my part. Uh, I'll tell you, every dentist that touches a CIRAC uh, knows about the IAOMT through me. Uh, and every dentist that I train, I, I recommend that they belong to this organization because I think, like I said, you guys have done an incredible job. Uh, and I will continue to do whatever I can do for sure. Here, here. Just a quick comment. Uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, Dr. Bucco for accepting to come at, at late notice like this. As we really appreciate you. Thank you so much. You bring us science that we do truly appreciate. Thank you. And Dr. Moran, I want to thank you for putting more pep and more youth in my practice with the CEREC. <laughs> uh, uh. Since, uh, since that's been out, I've been waking up every morning looking forward to go back to work after 30 years of practice. It's really rejuvenated. Thank you. That's great. I have a question that I've asked several other panels and never known, uh, none, none have known the answer to, so I'll just check with this erudite group. Uh, when a, a medication containing fluoride, such as Cipro or Prozac or any of these, it goes into the body, is the fluoride that is attached to the molecule, does it dissociate and end up uh, going through the body or is it excreted with one of the, either the, uh, uh, the co parent compound it was with or um, it's one of its metabolites. The, you, well, uh, the, on, the, uh, the only study I know was done by a, a physician, a psychiatrist in uh, San Francisco measuring the fluoride level in urine and that way he was measuring his, his Prozac, Prozac dose. And uh, so I'm going to let Hardy give it a go. There are actually quite a few drugs that defluorinate through the cytochrome P450 uh, enzyme systems. Uh, Cipro is one of them, uh, Diflucan, general anesthetics. There are a whole bunch of them that defluorinate. But you also have to remember it's the dose that's important. You can calculate how much percentage of fluoride comes off these drugs. And the dosage that you give them, say for a two-week period for, say, antibiotics. And it really is not a lot. Relative to drinking uh, public Relative water? Well. It, on the other hand, Kybold, the idiot that went and killed all the kids in Colorado, was taking a, an equivalent dose of 16 milligrams a day of fluoride. Just a quick announcement. Um, Freya here has lost a blue folder. It's an exhibitor's folder. If uh, I can just check in your piles that you have in front of you. If you know of anybody that's inadvertently picked up that folder, um, give her a uh, dingle. What room are you in? Do you know? 508. 508. And as well, She's still got some t-shirts. Those are those good-looking black t-shirts this year. So. We've actually run out of them, but people are ordering them, and it's the FDA t-shirt, and it's a great shirt to walk around and educate the public with, if you're interested. <gasps> Lots of looks. I have a question for uh, David and uh, maybe even Jeff. Um, in terms of this recertification uh, to the FDA class 3 dental devices? Is that what you're trying to do for the amalgams? Wouldn't that also mean that implants like uh, CEREC will also have to be class 3? That not necessarily. Is, is it class 3 re basically requires, this is really a, a question for the attorney, but the definition of implants, any substance implanted in natural or man-made body cavity, and it must be classified as class three unless the manufacturers can furnish evidence of safety. So when you're implanting little plugs of porcelain and so forth, as long as you don't use a fluoride releasing cement, that you probably are able to show in animal studies and so forth, you can feed them a ton and so forth, you can get it up to a class two by those kinds of studies. Nobody's gonna be able to show that a time-release mercury filling is safe. It's, Everybody in, well, composites actually are FDA approved. Um, they went through the normal certification process. And they say they were invented long after the FDA was formed. And so to get composites on the market in the first place, they had to go through the, the testing. You know, and it's, it's a pretty simple test where they implant it under a rabbit's ear and see if he scratches and so forth. No, it, it gets inflamed. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> I, I was kidding.
Yeah, I was uh, just wondering, this is for Dr. Bose, um, if a skeleton has been poisoned for several years with um, one of the um, bisphosphonates, how do you expect it to re- by what mechanism would it recycle in 12 years? Well, the only way to get rid of the bisphosphonate, the, the strong, the cancer-related ones, is to get rid of the molecule, the, the bone crystal, hydroxyapatite crystal that is, it's attached to. And uh, the, you have a point, the osteoblastic as well as osteoclastic activity is reduced, they're designed to be reduced by these drugs, so it may take a lot longer, but that, nobody's done that study. So 12 years might not be a realistic. 12 years may not be enough, yeah. We'll have to wait around and see. <laughs> David, your video may touch on this, but you were, uh, in one of the uh, lectures, we were told that altitude affects the toxicity of fluoride. And I don't, I don't get the connection for that. Obviously, that's probably why the horses were having uh, bigger problem than what we see in the flatland of Texas. Or maybe you're seeing it and don't recognize it. These horses went, these are, these are show horses. This lady spent hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars on veterinarians. And it wasn't until she contacted Jeff Green, who put her in contact with the Cornell Department of Veterinary Medicine. And they said, well, have they done any bone biopsies? Do you have a bone? And she said, no, but they assured me it wasn't fluoride. And Dr. Cook says, well, you can't tell if it's fluoride without the bone. So Wayne had to go get the backhoe and dig it up. So, and that's actually in the uh, poisoned horses, which is coming up very shortly, by the way. And uh, the, the, the two scientific studies that ended up being published, um, where they actually did bone ash and measured the bone, did histology, and established not only her horse, but several neighborhood horses, yes, Altitude may affect it. And, and how much did they reduce Denver because of the altitude? Oh, it's at one part per million? I guess they didn't reduce it at all. So anyway, the, the problem is nationwide. Is even that what, at, even is that what the level there in Pagosa Springs was, was one, one part per million? Or? Allegedly. Okay. Well, we have, we have out in West Texas, we've probably got three and four uh, parts per million at least. Uh, you, of course, it's not. It's, it's Cimarron natural, is it's one, and, and uh, uh, there was actually a study by uh, um, Leone in the 50s where he showed a fourfold increase in heart attack in the high fluoride West Texas town, and they said, see, no problem. <laughs> There's no sarcasm in Dr. Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> not a bit. Uh, just a question for any, anybody who can answer it. Um, the safety of composite resins concerning the bisphenol. We've actually funded a study on that, uh, and it's been a little slow in getting started because there was bisphenol A in the atomic spec equipment, so we've finally figured out how to clean the, clean the tubes and get it going, but it, it's looking, preliminary data indicates that what's in the composite is bis-GMA, and the theory was it might break down to bisphenol uh, A in some composites. Some composites don't contain bis-GMA. There is a different kind of uh, composite. So anyway, so far the numbers are coming out like it ain't there. But we'll, we'll have the answers with, by the next meeting. And I hope you've signed up. It's in San Antonio. Did I tell you that? are that you're finding, whether it's bacterial, heavy metals, fungal, any of those, any information? You're talking about the NECO cases? Yeah, the histology, by the way, uh, I, I have a whole PowerPoint presentation on the various por forms of histology, and it, uh, I had to learn how to use hyperlink and PowerPoint in order to do it, so uh, you guys can get back to me to tell me if it's uh, user-friendly or not, but the histology is it's been shown in animal studies. Uh, actually, the pig is the best model for osteonecrosis. They just put a pig in and out of a hyperbaric chamber 40, 40 times, and uh, they've almost guaranteed to have osteonecrosis of the hip. And so uh, it's a good model. It happened to be the pig that Bob Jones used on his cavitat, so that, that worked out. He found a bunch of uh, 
um, lesions in the jaws. Yeah. But at any rate, uh, the histology has been pretty well shown. The, the, there's focal infarction that leads to a little blip of blood. And until you realize it, uh, we're so used to looking at soft tissue in pathology that, and, and we see, you know, you get, you, the surgeon breaks through a, a vessel and you see that in soft tissue. But in bone, in fatty marrow, that is at least in J Japan, which is one of the osteonecrosis leaders in the science right now, uh, they consider that the very first sign. If, if the fatty marrow looks perfectly normal, but there's a little blip of blood, then they had an infarction and that's ischemic damage. But as time goes on, as you slowly strangle the flow of blood through the fatty tissue, fat cells are pretty tough, but fibers are even tougher. And uh, the first thing that goes are the, any hematopoietic cells. But in the jaws, except the mandibular third molar, we don't really have that to deal with anyway. And uh, so those are gone, and the very next thing you see is dilated vessels because the problem is the blood can't get out of the bone. They don't know why, but about 80% of the time, at least in the hip, the flow is blocked from leaving the bone. And so dilated vessels have become, a, uh, capillaries have become a very big part of uh, making the diagnosis. And then over a period of time, you see what I call a streaming fibrosis. You get this loose fibrous tissue between perfectly normal fat cells. And as time goes on, fat cells die and uh, they're replaced by fibrous tissue. So a really long-term disease would have no fat cells left in the bone marrow. It's all loose fibrous tissue. And there's a certain amount of inflammatory response. But, uh, and so there will be a few lymphocytes sprinkled here and there. And wherever you put fibers down in bone marrow. Fibers of any kind in bone marrow are forbidden. You just don't see it. They're not there at all. The only fibers are the invisible reticulum fibers, and they're really telephone wires rather than structural things. Um, so what you end up with is this more and more fibrosis, and then the, the fibers become more dense over time. And then you get focal areas of death, uh, and that's pretty easy to see. The, f the fat cells actually develop a granular cytoplasm instead of the clear color because usually they're just liquid fat. And uh, another thing that's found is oil cysts, which you guys can see with your naked eye at surgery. And an oil cyst, according to the hip literature, is created because there's, an in, there's a clot that plugs off the flow to a cluster of fat cells and they all die at the same time. And all the liquid is released at the same time and it just coalesces in, into a bubble. Um, and uh, there, are, it, it went, bone that's created under chronic ischemic conditions, the cement lines aren't very well formed, so when we slice through it with our blades, it breaks open and makes these very nice little, they're called micro cracks. There's, there are probably a dozen microscopic terms that are only, that were all created by the orthopedic uh, pathologists that are used exclusively for this disease. Did that answer your question? Uh, oh, the co I left a copy with um, your, your officers, so um, that you can get that at, at will, or you can email me and I can send you a copy. Hi, uh, Dr. Foucault, I'm working with pain here because I have the condition which you've described. Um, you and Coach K at Duke University. <laughs> I'd like to know what I can do about it. Um, and I just heard you mention the hyperbaric oxygen. I have um, osteoporosis, um, osteonecrosis, um, um, osteoarthritis, but they say the osteoarthritis um, was evident before the ABN. Now, I'm a candidate, that's what they say. I don't know what to believe. Yeah. And I'm listening to you and bone marrow edema and the cysts. Everything, I and I don't want hip surgery. So I, I'm just wondering: is there anything else, any research that has been done, perhaps hyperbaric oxygen to restore the blood supply? I don't know. Well, I should have explained. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen is a way to make pigs get osteonecrosis, and it's really not the oxygen; it's the in and out, oh. I guess. And um, but that is also, as you know, one of the main stay treatments for humans with osteonecrosis of the hip. And it's been tried in bisphosphonate. I know at Harvard, they, they're going deeper and deeper, uh, getting higher and higher atmospheric pressures, and they're making 40, 50, 60 dives with bisphosphonate patients before they're getting a response. 
So um, I think hyperbaric chamber therapy has a, a benefit in humans. It's just that in the back of our minds, we have to wonder, well, why would it cause it in one animal and, not, and be a cure in another? Surgery is the same way. The treatment of uh, ischemic damaged bone is to scrape it all out and cross your fingers. And yet trauma is one of the major causes of the same thing. I know that. Yeah. So with a jawbone, you can do a NICO surgery. If you do a similar surgery on the hip and remove the... Um, you have to do a whole hip, bone, hip replacement. You have to do a hip replacement. Yeah, yeah there's no, no alternative. There, there are some people that, w that take a trephine, about a centimeter wide burr, and, or drill essentially, and take out a core sample. And they're stirring up the pot and hoping that with inflammatory changes, there'll be some healing. And uh, there is a chance that that would, would heal, but uh, it seems as if after several years, people are back to where they were before. Do you have any research on the uh, use of hyperbaric oxygen improving the bone density? Hyperbaric oxygen to improve bone density. I can't remember reading a paper on that even. So I, I don't know or if it's been. Osteoarthritis, either one? I don't think of it. I don't, I mean, I'm always reading bone papers and I don't remember anything like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I've got a couple of diseases with, that are almost as hopeless as yours. And it's rough. Yeah. Uh, the cavitation or the night infection has been diagnosed. Treated surgically. Can we hear you? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the night collision has been, uh, or knee collision is being treated surgically, curated the area and everything. Now you're, you're looking at this big hole, let's say in the manual, everything is empty. How do you treat it? What are the options there? Are, bone graft recommended is uh, any treatment, I mean, how do we make this bone come you, back? You have hit on one of my great frustrations. I'm not a surgeon, so I have to talk a surgeon into doing that, and uh, there are lots of different ways of treating that. Uh, the Ratner technique is to make a little hole, and every week the patient would come back and you stick a small curette in, and, uh, or maybe even a needle, and suck out fluid. And, um, I know at least one patient who had that done over a two-year period, uh, every week, and she got better. So, but most people, if it's an oral surgeon, they, they get a big exposure, and they usually try to go in from the side so that they can keep the crestal bone. But I, I tell you, people I assume to be good oral surgeons, uh, some will just leave it empty and sew up the mucosa as tight as they can, uh, or others will put uh, foam, maybe with an antibiotic in there, and some try the um, collagen plugs, and uh, some people use bone proteins, morphogenic proteins, um, and nobody seems to have a super success rate. Overall, the success rate's around 70%, but it doesn't seem to make any difference with the surgery. Well, it depend, doesn't seem to depend on the type of surgery. Meaning that area will continue to be... Uh that's going to be an area in question. I think that is, I mean, we'll, we have to dig deeper into the causes and the pathophysiology, how this stuff progresses. But really, what I'd like to see somebody do is uh, compare different surgical techniques. Uh, even in my uh, follow-up study of 103 people, uh, that was an average of five years after their last surgery, I think about one-third of them had to have at least one other surgery. Um, so even failure, this is a strange disease because failure through one surgery doesn't, doesn't necessarily condemn you. Um, that's it's just a, a frustration. Well, thanks to our panel. Thanks to everybody for uh, staying late.